Okay, so this is lecture 22. So last time we derived, uh, we went through, yesterday we went through Yang-Mills uh, theory in uh, quite a bit of detail in the matrix form, where the gauge field was a Hermitian matrix A mu. The field strength was a Hermitian matrix F mu nu. And the parameter of gauge transformations was a Hermitian matrix theta. So when we talk of the matrix properties, we always mean uh, properties which have nothing to do with these indices mu and mu nu. You see that this is a vector, this is a tensor, this is a scalar. But as far as being matrices, they were all Hermitian and traceless. And that's what defines SUN. So Hermitian and cross N and traceless defines SUN. And as I said, it's unlikely you'll need any other case, but if you need any other uh, Lie algebra like SON, then you can look it up. Okay, and we derived the Lagrangian. <coughs> And with only one trick, which was the Jacobi identity, which is in terms of matrices, it's quite an obvious identity, like it's very easy to derive. We were able to show that if A varies as 1 by G d mu theta, then F uh, variation is what? Um, <coughs> minus i f mu nu theta something is wrong here shouldn't i have a 1 by g is that missing in my notes no maybe this is correct actually i should not have a 1 by g the um, so 1 by g i think is in the gradient derivative yeah. Uh, yeah. No, it's out here, right? Mm. So, what did you say? Uh, I think uh, 1 by g is in the covariant derivative. Like, yeah. Inside uh, this? Yeah. No. So that's not what I have defined. Does anyone else agree with that? I disagree. But what is true is that if you take this d mu theta, then the last term of it has g, mm. a mu commutator theta, that g cancels this yeah. g. And this looks like the same thing with that A replaced by it. So you can say that A has a similar term as this plus an extra term 1 by G del mu theta. <coughs> I think this is correct. Okay. Now this was infinitesimal. What are the finite transformations in the matrix formalism? This I didn't at least discuss yesterday. So of course, remember how we got here. We first required this transformation by starting with a finite transformation f goes to u f u inverse hmm, where u is local depends on x that's why this is a local gauge invariance and uh, <coughs> so this we already know that we should expect this this is nothing but the infinitesimal version of that when u is e to the i theta okay what we proved yesterday which took some time was that this follows from the definition of f in terms of a if you vary a like this. If it doesn't follow from some variation of a then it's useless because f is not a fundamental field. f depends on a. So we need to know how to vary a and then that should tell us how to vary f. We can't just decide to vary f how we like if it depends on something else. So that part is what we had to do yesterday. So now the question is in the finite form f goes like this. So what does a do? So again, we expect there should be one term which looks like, okay, let us let me make this more transparent by writing this out in detail. This minus i a <coughs> theta. Yeah. So as I mentioned a few minutes ago, this term looks similar to this term. But this is new and it's special for the gauge potential while field doesn't have it. 
we use the word homogeneous for such a term because A transforms into A again times some things. But here, this is inhomogeneous because even if A was 0, it would get this term after transforming. So it's an inhomogeneous term. So F is purely homogeneous. But A has this inhomogeneous term and homogeneous term. And yesterday there was a question about <coughs> relation to the covariant derivative in gravity. And the idea is similar. If you have been learning this Christoffel symbol or affine connection that arises in gravity, uh, that arises in the second term of the covariant derivative and it compensates for something in the first term such that things transform nicely. So that's what the job of covariant derivative is. But uh, the formalism isn't exactly the same and the, the uh, only the very kind of big picture is the same. So you don't have to worry about it too much, but uh, since uh, it was asked yesterday, I mentioned that. Now, <coughs> um, yeah, so now we need to know how does A transform in the finite transformation. So there should be one term for this and there should be one term for this in the finite case. And the term for this we can immediately guess is going to be U A mu, U inverse. But there should be a term corresponding to this. That means the term which in the infinitesimal limit gives this. And that term will be of order 1 by g. And it will be u del mu u inverse. So we have to add these two terms. And there's also an i. You can imagine that the i belongs with del. I think we have emphasized a few times that i times del by del x is a Hermitian of operator not del by del x okay so it's not surprising that i comes but if you think about it u inverse is e to the minus i theta <coughs> so if i want to evaluate this uh, uh, for small theta i would expand this as 1 minus i theta then this derivative will give me minus i del mu theta and the minus i will cancel that i this will just be 1 and i'll get this term so that's how you get the infinitesimal from the finite term. Okay, so that answers how the finite transformations are defined. Uh, and now the next thing we want to do is to actually discuss the component form. So in terms of difficulty, it's quite curious. The matrix version is somewhat simpler to do calculations than the component form. But the component form is simpler if I restrict to SU2, then it's really simple. Okay, But the matrix form, as you can see, really doesn't care what n of SU n we chose. All the manipulations are exactly the same. But SU2 is a very nice uh, algebra that is a little simpler than others. And uh, therefore, the component form is quite okay uh, for SU2. Now, in doing Feynman diagram calculations, uh, which, is, which are important if any of you is going to do particle physics in the future, whether theoretical or experimental, uh, at least you should know how it's done. You don't have to necessarily do it. I don't think nowadays either theorists or experimentalists actually do Feynman diagram calculation by hand. It's done on a computer. But uh, you still need to know what the computer is doing. After all, you might need to someday program that computer or you might need to check a program or something. So this is important. In that uh, case, I think this is better because it puts everything, makes everything very explicit. It's tedious, but it's very explicit. Uh, while here, you know, the, the stuff in these fields is buried inside a matrix or some matrix elements. And there are some subtleties, for example, when we have a Hermitian matrix, uh, it could, for example, have real entries or it could have imaginary entries. Uh, but if they are real, then they should be the same on both sides of the diagonal. And if they are imaginary, they should be opposite on both sides of the diagonal. I'm sure you know this. You probably know that sigma 1, the Pauli matrix is U1, uh, 0, 1, 1, 0, which is Hermitian. Sigma 2 is 0 minus I, I, 0, which is also Hermitian. So this is imaginary and anti-symmetric, this is real and symmetric. Okay. So keeping track of all this becomes a little stressful uh, in the matrix formalism, while in the component form, you see the components and they are all real. 
so the components will just be real and there'll be nothing there'll be in fact essentially no i factors anywhere in the component formalism <coughs> okay so um let's do it <coughs> so this is actually how we started but now we are going back to it we have generators ta of the algebra they satisfy I F A B C T C. This defines the structure constants of the algebra, and it's not obvious from this. It's obvious from this relation that this is anti-symmetric in A and B, but actually, um, if you choose the basis correctly, it's fully anti-symmetric in all three. So you can freely permute any pair of indices. You can also cyclically permute like A B C and C A B and B C A. Those are all the same. B A C is minus of F A B C and so on. The problem is that to know the Fs, you have to decide how your basis is normalized and you have to then still look them up for most SUNs, but only for SU2 and only for SU2, this is epsilon A B C, the anti-symmetric symbol. This is the main simplification in SU2. What is the number of values that these can take? Well, that's the number of generators T A. So the range of the uh, index A. What's that range? It's the number of independent Hermitian matrices we can have in n, n cross n matrices. How many can we have? The answer is n squared minus 1. So A, uh, yeah, and traceless, exactly. So the way we count this number is that um, a general matrix has n squared entries because uh, n squared complex entries, n squared entries and each of them can be complex. Okay. However, when we say it's Hermitian, uh, that makes the entry either real or imaginary, uh, real and then symmetric or imaginary and anti-symmetric. So in every case, the complex number is cut down by half. So we get n squared from 2n squared. Finally, there's one trace condition, trace is 0, so we get n squared minus 1. What is that for SU2? This is 3. So SU2, A goes from 1 to 3. And that's why we have 3 Pauli matrices. Yes. So you said that for uh, preferred basis, I can make FABC anti-symmetric. Yes. Means basis means, are you saying simulated transformation? <coughs> yeah. Uh, so the problem is, okay, so there's... <laughs> There's a bit of a trick about raising and lowering these indices. Normally, we don't worry about raising and lowering them. But um, there's, a there's a thing called killing form, which is like a metric on that space. And if that metric is identity, then we are in good shape or proportional to identity. But it need not be. So I'll give you an example. If you look at the Pauli matrices, then sigma 1... Um, Sigma A, Sigma A, I mentioned this yesterday. Sigma A by 2 is the T for SU2. So let's look at this case. I sum over A from 1 to 3. And uh, I take the trace also. So it's trace of that. And I get 1 by 2. Why? Because each Sigma squared is 1. Uh, yes. Uh, sorry, yeah, each Sigma squared. No, something I did wrong. Sorry, I didn't mean to do that. I meant to take the trace of sigma A, sigma B, and I get delta A, B over 2. Yeah. So if I pick A equals B, like just sigma 1, then sigma squared is 1, identity matrix. Trace of that gives me a factor 2, because it's a 2 by 2 matrix. This is 4, so I get 1 by 2. So this is the normalization. Okay. Now, uh, this is one basis, the basis that we know. This is no summation. Uh, no summation. Absolutely none. Thank you. I was confused. Okay. Now there's another basis of Pauli matrices which sometimes comes up, which is called can can you see down here? Shall I move up? I can move up. Another basis of Pauli matrices is called sigma plus, sigma minus, and sigma three. And here sigma plus is this. And sigma minus is this. 
and sigma 3 is what it was. Of course, here you can see they are not even Hermitian. Uh, but of course, you can see also that by suitable linear combination of these two, I can get both sigma 1 and sigma 2. Hmm? So, they contain the same amount of information. They also span the algebra. Problem is, now if I want this kind of normalization, I should multiply sigma plus with sigma minus. If I take sigma plus and I square it, I get 0. So, weird matrix that if I square it, I just get 0. So, the metric is plus minus type that I should multiply sigma plus with sigma minus. So, that complicates things and then you have to be much more careful and sometimes those are useful. This, this basis actually is related to what is called the Cartan basis and it's useful for generic SUNs. The analog of this for SUN is useful. So, in that basis, uh, F will have indices not A, B, C but plus minus, I mean, they will have some plus type, some minus type then raising and lowering plus will change it to minus and it's very complicated. So then all these symmetries are just a little more complicated. I don't even remember exactly the rule. Um, I think the most general rule is that C should be down and you should never bring it up. That's in the most general basis. Then it's anti-symmetric only in A and B. But as I said, in the real basis that we work in, uh, it's totally anti-symmetric. So that's the theory. So this is just in response to your question that what other kind of basis could there be? There are other basis. Um, Sir? Yeah. So you said that uh, in the case of SU2, uh, you get epsilon ABC. Yes. But you said that FABC can be made totally anti-symmetric for yeah. any n. So yes, anti-symmetric, but it's not epsilon even then because if the ABC take many values, you see epsilon has a special feature that its value is already, that you don't have to look up epsilon ABC. If I tell you that it's totally anti-symmetric and its entries have only three possible values, each ABC <coughs> takes only three values, then you'll conclude on your own without any help that epsilon 1, 2, 3, I have to fix once and for all, might as well fix it to be 1, then all other epsilon 3, 1, 2, 3, 2, 1, everything is fixed and there's, that's the end of it. So it's like there's only one independent one which we normalize to 1. For FABC, it's not at all like that. Uh, in SU3, for example, you have FABC, each of A, B, and C take nine, eight values. SU3 has dimension eight. So you have, you know, F145, F178, F234, F256. I mean, there are lots of Fs, and you have to look them up. You can, of course, construct them. It's group theory is not that this uh, low rank SUNs are not difficult to derive entirely from scratch. But uh, still, it's not, just, it's not just some simple thing. And for example, identities between epsilons uh, are simpler than identities between f's when we multiply, which we'll see in a moment. Yeah, I feel I'm doing the right thing to tell you all this today because sort of this is your chance to learn it once and for all. And any kind of particle physics, you're sure to need it. But actually nowadays it's more and more fashionable in condensed matter physics also to look at non-abelian symmetries in this and that context. And so it's definitely going to be good for you, uh, whatever you do. Okay, so what did we say? We said component form, so I wrote a lot of stuff trying to explain a few things. But what I wanted to write was that A is that, F similarly is this. and theta similarly is this. So it's like everybody gets expanded in a basis of the generators of SUN. And the coefficients now are absolutely real numbers. They're just a set of real numbers. It's much easier to keep in mind that they are real, okay? If there's anything to do with imaginary or real, that's all in the T's. It's not in the things in front. And the T's don't depend on X, only these things are the fields which depend on X. So in this way, you can stare at it and say, aha, I have N squared minus one copies of a vector field. You can right away see that. And you'll also see in a moment, uh, but you've already realized, I'm sure, that the free part of the Yangmills Lagrangian is nothing but a sum of copies of the free Lagrangian for each of these fields. So that's also nice. That tells us something about the free theory uh, let's do it actually. Let's write the Lagrangian immediately in component form. And 
what is it? It is L is going to be minus one fourth F mu nu A. So we had this unusual looking half normalization in the matrix form, but then because of this extra half in that trace T A T B, uh, we get this, a half outside and this, and now you can see that uh, it's a sum over n f's. However, each f is a complicated function of a, and we can work that function out. <coughs> it's del mu a mu a minus del mu a mu a plus g. So I promised you that all i's would be gone. And this is it. Now the only convention which sometimes uh, which, which confuses because if you compare with the textbook is that sometimes g is replaced by minus g. It turns out in this theory g and minus g are physically equivalent. Uh, the perturbation series is actually in powers of g squared. Actually you might know that in even in electromagnetism the perturbation series is in powers of e squared which we rename as the fine structure constant e squared over 4 pi. So there could be a minus here in some textbooks, then there would be a plus in the matrix version. I had a minus ig in the matrix version. So that's the only convention, yes. Sir, you said we can choose, we can take f a b c to be totally anti-symmetric. Yes. So in suitable basis, we can drop the last No, we can never drop the last one. Because this is symmetric, this is anti-symmetric. What is symmetric? A, a, B, mu, A, C, mu. It's only symmetric under exchange of the whole A with the whole A. It's anti-symmetric under exchange of B and C. And in the Lagrangian, it will also be anti-symmetric under exchange of mu and nu. That makes it symmetric. Twice anti-symmetric is symmetric. You can't drop it. This is absolutely non-zero. And it's very, very, very important in your annuals. Okay. Do you see my point? Let's, let's, uh, understand it. This thing is by anti-symmetry of f, this is equal to minus g. So I interchange b and c, then I get a minus sign. So I write a c b, a mu b, a mu c. <coughs> I've used anti-symmetry of f. Now I rename c as b and b as c. So I get still minus g f a b c a mu c a mu b did i get minus of what i started with no because of this lower indices okay what it does tell me is something else which is important this part is anti-symmetric in mu and nu visibly this part doesn't look anti-symmetric in mu and nu, but because of anti-symmetry in B and C, it is effectively anti-symmetric also in mu and nu. So that actually this F is anti-symmetric. If Fs were not anti-symmetric, then this would not be would not be anti-symmetric, but it should be. The field strength is always anti-symmetric. So thanks for asking because these are kinds of confusions that do crop up. So this is always non-zero. The only case where it could be zero is if we are working with the group U1, then A, B, and C have only one value to take and there is no F and we are in back in the abelian theory. Also, we could take a limit G goes to zero, then that goes away and we are again back in the abelian theory, but we have N squared minus one copies of that abelian theory. It's sort of, it's nice to know because it means that in perturbation theory, the zeroth order contribution in Yang Mills theory comes from just copies of a free theory. And so it's going to be the same. And so, for example, many things that I do in the free theory, like fixing the gauge, I can do using the same information as I had for the abelian case. Okay. So there are many, and uh, even uh, another one is normalizing. How did I get the one fourth? Because in the free limit, this is just n copies of the n squared minus one copies of the abelian theory, and each of them has a minus one fourth, so it should be minus one. It's not that this is a sacred normalization, but it's the one which we decided on for the abelian theory, so this fix, uh, fits with that. Shouldn't be different. Okay, so f is that. Good.
and uh, what is the variation of A under which this Lagrangian is invariant? It is 1 by G d mu theta A minus F A B C theta B A mu C which we can package into d mu theta a b sorry d mu a b theta b um, both of these can be just easily derived starting from the matrix version and just doing expanding in these and you know that this thing is invertible because I have explained in the notes why the expansion in T's can be inverted. That is, if I know the components, I can find the matrix. But if I know the matrix, I can also find the components. So, yeah. So, this is it. And again, no I is anywhere. So and yes. There should be delta L multiplied to D mu theta L. Delta theta L. Uh, no, one because one this has one index and this also has one index. The other two are contracted. So, there is nothing. But if you want me to write D mu AB, then your delta AB will be in it. This equation is fine. There is only one free index in this equation. Every term has one index A which is free. So there is no other index. But if you want me to say what is D mu AB? Yeah. It is del mu delta AB. Okay, I will keep the 1 by G outside. Del mu delta AB minus FABC uh, A mu C. So it is a differential operator with one <laughs> derivative term and one term linear in A and that is it. And now we see that this part of it is symmetric in AB and this part is anti-symmetric in AB. So the whole D mu does not have either symmetry or anti-symmetry in AB. It has one part of each kind. Good. All going well so far. Now deriving the gauge transformation, we will do it here. It is a, as I said, we will uh, we'll do it in general and it is a bit tedious but let me start. So, I have written it all out very carefully. So, uh, of course, uh, deriving the gauge transformation can be done starting from the matrix version where we already had it. Hmm? What I want to show is that under this gauge transformation in component form, this one transforms in a certain way such that that is invariant, all self-contained within component form. Hmm? So, that we are confident about the component form without having to go back to matrices. Okay. So, what is variation of F mu nu A? Well, this, uh, because of this second line, it is um, it's obviously del mu delta A nu minus del mu delta A mu plus two terms from here, either delta of this or delta of that. So, four terms. So, those terms are del mu D nu theta. Uh, so, this quantity I will sometimes write for short as d mu theta a. What you should realize is that it is not d mu of theta a, but d mu of theta then a. Uh, because the index is not the one that was on the original theta. But we can certainly get by writing it if we know that. So, it is this minus the anti-symmetric version. So, Again, I can do the trick I did before, which is write only one set of terms and then put minus mu goes to nu. Uh, no, actually, it's better to do it this way explicitly in this case. Okay. Plus G F A B C delta A mu B A mu C plus G F A B C. Well, I could put a bracket here plus a mu b delta a mu c. Sir? Yes. Here does your definition of del mu have a 1 by g outside or does it? Uh, does not Sir, there should be ah, inside. Sorry, this should be. Ah, so, I should have a 1 by g here. And now I think I am good. Let me try. And this should be d theta. There should also be a g in the uh, here, of course. This I forgot to write. Now I think we're good. Yes, is that okay? 
So everywhere I have a variation of h replaced by d theta with a 1 by g. And the 1 by g just stays outside the whole thing. And we get four terms. Now let's manipulate these terms. Sorry, I need to rub out some of this stuff. Okay, <coughs> the next step is to notice that some of the terms already cancel. For example, capital D contains a small d, del mu, del nu, and this contains also a small d, and those two just cancel. So that we can skip. And so in the end, we have, uh, so del mu acts only on the uh, a theta part of this, and del nu acts on the a theta part of that. So we have minus del mu uh, <coughs> theta b a mu c. There's an f a b c which I keep outside. <coughs> yes, this plus del mu theta b a mu c. Talk is wet. I think. A mu C. Yeah, that's two terms. Very good. That's from these two terms. Hmm? And uh, mm, yes, that's because this del acts on everything to the right of it. And what's to the right of it is apart from del nu theta, there's also A theta with a structure constant. And that's the term here, and del has to differentiate the whole thing. So it will differentiate this term by chain rule, both terms. So that I haven't done yet. I haven't expanded it out. Now we go to these terms. Now in these terms, the d mu theta starts with ordinary del mu theta. Okay, so I'll write those. That uh, already has an FABC, um, and this g cancels with this g, so I don't have to write it. And so I can just write directly plus del mu theta b a mu c minus del mu theta b a mu c. And finally, I have the set of terms which are quadratic in A, which are, so this I'll close this bracket here. No, I don't have to close this bracket here. And I write minus g. Um, FBDE theta D A E and you see minus G F C B E A new B A new C A new E. So let's close our bracket here and stand back and check what we have written. <coughs> so the first two terms I'm sure of them, they came from this and this first line. The second line came from taking this D mu theta <coughs> and replacing it by only del mu theta, not the other term. So that's the second line, that's straightforward. The third term came by writing here minus g, so d mu, I should have kept the definition of d mu theta everywhere. So d mu theta b is del mu theta b minus f b uh, d e theta d a mu e. So I've used that with a g in it. In it. So I've used the second term of that. And you can see that that's how this came, <coughs> hmm? because I in this from this I took this term, and then I just wrote down a new c. Is that clear? Yes. Sir, but that's but g already, g outside, right? Excuse me, g outside, g outside. Uh, g yeah, yeah. But there's another g. There's a g here. There's a g here, and there's a one by g there. So the net result is a g, is a g. And also, you, if you stare at these terms, you'll see that this is linear in A, this is linear in A, this is quadratic in A. 
when it's quadratic in a, it has one more power of g. Yes. The second term should be plus sign and. Second a. term should be plus sign. No, it's not plus sign. It's not opposite sign here, is it? Plus. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, Why should it be plus? It comes from this. Yeah. And d plus. nu theta. I'm again expanding, uh, keeping this term. In d nu theta c. So I have to rename this b as c. So this is g times f c something something theta that thing a mu that thing. So c is theta. Uh, c. Uh, theta six. You are saying maybe I have. No, you see a mu b is just this. It's just copied. So there should be a mu b there, right? Copy. There is a mu b. This no, mu the, b. the upper term, sir. Here. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. Ah, here there might be. Yes, okay. here there should be. Uh, no, wait, wait, wait. And this is no, 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 no. That's that's fine. There's nothing wrong. There's an FABC outside. There's an FABC outside. Okay. There's an FABC outside. So FABC is outside. Everything should have only B and C as free indices. So this one has B as a free index. D and E are contracted, and C is free. This one has C as a free index. B also, and D and E are contracted, and there's a theta in this. I just forgot to write theta b. A mu b. B. Yeah. There, there you go. It's correct. There's no minus sign. What did I do? I took d mu theta from here, pulled out this term, and pasted it here. Then I took d mu theta from here, pulled out the corresponding term, and pasted it here. The other a just went along for the right, and that's what I got. Okay, so now you can see what the nightmare of component formalism is, which is that all the indices need to be summed up, and to be summed up, they need to have labels, and those labels can be changed at will. Okay, I can rename D as J and rename this D as J, and nothing will change. Hmm? And I may need to do that to get everything into a nice form at the end. But first, I see some nice things happening. And some of you also noticed those nice things. Sir, yes. Sorry, but uh, yeah. uh, that uh, second term, yeah. uh, then a new theta b, yes. that should be plus sign no? because it's coming from <coughs> It is coming from this. Second term plus. Ah, ah sorry, that sorry, sorry. Term. I think that's what you, is that what you are saying? Yeah, I'm yeah. sorry. I think you are right. I think you are right. Um, uh, Yes, it's plus. Which idiot wrote minus? Somebody <laughs> must have written minus. Sir, but and this wait, uh, sir, but you, uh, like B and C are interchanged there, right? Because if there that D new, it was D new C. Where? Which term? Uh, sir, that term. There are six terms there. Tell me the number. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six. D and C will also change. Where? D and C. Well, in the fourth term. Ah, so that term has this term? Yeah. Yeah, so that's the FABC is everything ah. the minus sign will be there. No, no, no. There's, uh, yeah, yeah, but uh, we are not, oh, sorry. I, then I shouldn't have entered, then I might have just copied wrong. See, I have a problem reading at close distance, and it's showing here. This is C, and you're yeah. quite right. Now, everybody's happy? Everybody's happy? Good. Very good. And now we see some good things happening. A few terms cancel. For example, here if this del acts on theta, it cancels this. And here if this del acts on theta, it cancels this. So these terms are gone. And those terms can be replaced. So this becomes FABC minus theta del mu A mu C. Um, and actually, I can write this del mu A mu C. The first line has become this. Is this good? How is it cancelling? Uh, when del mu acts on theta. The other term. It's not cancelling, that's here. Oh. Hmm? What is cancelled, I didn't write. So del mu acts on a product, so it can act on first or second term. When it acts on the first term, it cancels with the next line, so I don't write it, and I don't write the next line also. When it acts on the second term, it's here. So therefore, I pretend that del acts only on the second term. This is good. This much is good. And now see something has nice has happened. All del thetas have gone away. 
So we are encouraged that finally, this is we are trying to calculate the variation of f is not going to involve del theta, so it will be homogeneous. So that's good news. Had to go away. If it was staying, I, it means I did something wrong. These are the ways we check the calculation. Okay, so this is this term, but I still have to write the last term, <coughs> and that's just I will just copy it. F. So this last term is minus g. Then this f, this f. And minus g f a b c f c d e theta d a mu b a mu e and that's the correct answer and we are, that's the answer so far but we are not done because it doesn't look like what we want we want delta f to be proportional to f itself what did we get we got two terms in f and there's one term we should get but instead we have this and it's a little complicated okay is this okay though people are okay with this expression this is correct now the next step depends on whether i'm in su2 or sun it's easier in su2 because i use identities which contract this so this would be epsilon epsilon with one index b in common and summed it becomes delta delta minus delta delta so does this and then it becomes quite easy to combine these two terms into one and that's how I've done it in the solved exam paper, which you must have seen. But we don't want to assume SU2 here, so we'll try to manipulate this term in general, for general SU. How are we going to do that? Well, a nice thing is that we have, again, a quantum object called Jacobi identity. I hope something that you're getting out of all this discussion is that in the linear terms, everything is like the abelian theory. Okay, so if I put g equals 0 at this stage, then I, those terms are gone and this is exactly what I would expect f, uh, what I would expect, uh, well, that may be a bit, maybe that's not a correct statement because there's still f, a, b, c, but anyway, at least here I find the abelian f, okay, uh, but when I have two terms in a, then it's bilinear, quadratic in a, then I find two f's and then I find the g, so you should sort of be mentally attuned to expect those things and then when I have two f's then there is a Jacobi identity just like when I had three commutator something comma something comma something I had Jacobi identity so this is the analog of that so let's find out what's the Jacobi identity the problem is that these indices are not yet written in a form uh, well actually they are I think yeah they are written in a form but I think the correct thing at this stage would be to separate this into two parts. So we'll write, and this is something I always encourage you to do, that delta f mu nu a, which we are trying to calculate, is delta f mu nu a linear plus delta f mu nu a quadratic. This line is the linear, and these two lines are the quadratic. This line doesn't need any more work because it's already proportional to f mu nu, to the linear terms of f mu nu. These don't look proportional to the precise linear terms in uh, that I would require in f mu nu, the precise quadratic terms of f mu nu. So something has to be done to this. So we only manipulate f mu nu quadratic, and when we are done, we plug it back. And the quadratic terms are all proportional to minus g and they are also proportional to theta upper d. So I factor those out and I write f a b c f b d e a mu e a mu c and the other term is plus f a b c C D E A mu B A mu B. Is this good? And this is what I need to work on. Now, the Jacobi identity is an identity between F and F multiplied 
and summed over one index and with the other indices permuted okay but i can't start permuting anything because uh, right now because the indices on a on a's are not the same i want to take these a's out of this and then start permuting indices on the f's but i have to make the indices of these a's same as the indices of these a's that's my job so that requires a certain renaming and the renaming is b must become e in the second term in this term b should become e e should become c and um that's probably it b should become e e should become c c should become b here because c is the common summed index while here b is the common summed index hmm? so c should become b it's very easy once you get the hang of it then you'll find that this is f a b c the first term i didn't do anything to it the second term so this first term i just copy the second term under this replacement becomes b has become e so it's f a e b and the second term is f uh, b uh, b d c okay and what are the a's they were by construction a mu a a mu e a mu c so this is very good i've got the a's to be common so i can factor them out hmm? till i do that i can't use identities on this so let's factor them out so i'll just drop them <coughs> from here and write this now we are in a position to use the identity and where does this identity come from it comes exactly from matrices so in general if we take the generators of the lie algebra and write this plus permuting bca and cab i will get zero why because in any representation these are matrices when they are matrices i can expand it out and all the terms cancel and i get zero hmm? so plus cyclic equals zero but now t with t gives me a structure constant f b c d and then the remaining t which comes out commutes with this and gives me a second structure constant and so finally this whole identity gives me an identity on structure constants and that identity in fact it's a very crucial part of group theory and let me write that identity in the most useful form uh, it is before i okay so let me write the identity it is f b a c so again i emphasize you don't need all this for su2 but it's good to know it for su n f b a e b c d and i'll explain how to memorize this once and for all uh, i don't know if this is in the video equals zero. So here's the algorithm. Put the index that is summed right in the front or right at the back. It doesn't matter. So b is here, b is here, b is here, b is here, b is here in all all the terms. Okay, one index is summed, not two. Only one index is summed. So how many does that leave? Four, right? Now out of these four, pick one of them, say a in this case, and keep it in the same position in all the terms. Okay, now that leaves three indices, one here and two there. Now I cyclically sum C D E E C D D E C. Then I get Z. This is the way to remember this identity. It's a very beautiful identity, and if I apply it here, then I can show that, and it's done in the notes that this term. So. basically i have to do a little more work because here you see b is in the second place i have to bring it to the first place i'll get a minus here by cyclicity i bring it to the first place um and i don't get any minus but then to make the remaining three indices cyclic as in that sum i have to permute something it's very simple to do but just tedious 
and when I do all that, this pair of terms will add up to one term. That Jacobi identity is almost always used to take two terms and write them equal to minus of a third term with a different placement of indices. So this becomes minus f of a b uh, <coughs> b a uh, minus f of in this case b a d <coughs> f of b e c exactly what's there. So I made these two terms look like these two terms and not minus, I get plus actually because first I make these two terms look like these two but they come out with minus signs. So that's equal to plus of that. So I get this and my A's haven't, I haven't done anything to them. A, mu, A, mu, C. So this is delta F quad with a minus G theta which I've been forgetting. So I should put it back. So now there is a minus theta, minus g and a theta d. And that's it. That's the whole thing. Okay. Now I should remember my f linear, which unfortunately has gone away long ago. And f linear also had theta d. And then it had del mu a nu minus del mu a mu. And so if I combine them, I will find that, uh, okay, so this can be rewritten. Uh, by renaming, this can be rewritten as minus g uh, theta b, sorry, the linear part had theta b, and then f a b c, f c d e, a mu d, a mu e. And now we are in good shape, because the linear part, so delta f is equal to the linear part which was minus f a b c theta b del mu a mu c minus del mu a mu c minus this thing above. And the nice thing is it's theta b and f a b c are common and then this stuff And now we just factor out minus F A B C and theta B from both and write whatever is left and we get the answer. So delta F minus A is minus F A B C theta B then C C plus G. There's a G here. Um, F C D E. A mu D. A mu D. That's it. And this whole thing in brackets is my F mu. So I'm done. And now, why is the Lagrangian invariant under this? The Lagrangian now doesn't have any trace. It doesn't even have any matrices. It has this sum. And when I vary it, I should keep one fixed and vary the other in the infinitesimal variation. So delta L is minus half F A nu A. And varying the other one, let's call this F upper mu nu A. Varying the other one gives me that. And now uh, we observe that mu and nu are contracted. So there's A and there's C. And this symmetrizes A and C between these two terms because the mu and nu are contracted. So exchanging A and C leaves this term completely invariant. However, A and C is anti-symmetrized in F. So therefore, this is zero. In the case of matrix formulation, we proved the invariance using the cyclicity of the trace. So there's always some cyclicity going on. Here the cyclicity is in the uh, nature of the Fs. Hmm? There it is cyclicity in the trace. Here there's no trace. And as promised, there was no I anywhere in this calculation because in the component formula, everything's zero. Okay, 
So we got this, but of course it's easier to just get this directly from the uh, matrix form of the Lagrange. <coughs> and that's how Yang and Mills did it. Okay, any questions? Gloom has settled upon the audience. Well, this is Yang Mills' theory. I should say, you know, there are more things I could say, but I think now I can leave them to you in the notes. But, uh, you know, the amazing thing is that uh, there's some historical remarks. In 1960, literally no physicist except maybe Murray Gelman and uh, Neyman, Yuval Neyman also, two people, had really ever heard of any Lie algebra except SU2. SU2 everybody knew because SU2 is same as SO3 locally and it's the rotation algebra and we can't do quantum mechanics without the rotation algebra because the whole business of your angular momentum quantization and J, J squared operators, J, J plus one, this is all SU2 algebra. Hmm? Everything of that comes from SU2. Nobody had heard of this exotic thing called SU3, let alone any other SUN. And Yang was an exception. He obviously had studied uh, group theory. And uh, even before Gelman came on the picture with his quark hypothesis in 1960, <coughs> Yang and Mills, who were actually, I think, at the time, post two postdocs sharing an office, uh, thought, why not generalize, I told you this yesterday, global symmetry to local symmetry while retaining the non-abelian nature of the global symmetry. Now, in global symmetry, you need some group theory, but not too much. The idea of generalizing it to local symmetry, well, it needs all this Jacobi identity. Basically, actually, that's the only thing almost. That's, that's almost the only new thing. But they obviously knew it. And so they were, and in any case, as I've told you, with matrices, Jacobi identity is a trivial identity between three matrices, between some products, cubic products of matrices, just nested commutators. So with that information, they were able to carry out this generalization in 1954. And literally till 1970 or so, the vast majority of physicists didn't believe that it had anything to do with nature. And uh, the connection with nature came kind of suddenly, suddenly from a number of things where it was realized that this quark hypothesis of Gelman, actually, uh, you might have, you might know this history. The quark hypothesis of Gelman was that there are some quarks called up and down and strange, and their bound states describe mesons. This much you know, particle physics one, right? Okay. But then there was a problem with statistics, which is that uh, there was a famous, uh, I should stop now, but let me finish this comment. There was a famous uh, paradox that you have a particle, which is uh, called delta plus plus, which is made of u, u, u. U quarks, three u quarks. But uh, all of them have their spins in the same direction because the total spin of three quarks, it can be either half or three half, but delta has spin of three half. So that means these are all aligned. So they look and it, in the ground state, it means they're all in the same ground state and they all have the same spin. So they're in the same spin state. So they shouldn't exist by Pauli exclusion principle, but delta plus plus very much exists. That was a paradox, okay? <coughs> How is it possible to evade Pauli exclusion principle? And the answer was to assume that these quarks transform in an, a, another group which was so far not observed at all and so they have an extra label called color and that u goes to u a and b goes to d a so there are three u quarks three d quarks etc it seemed like a most abs absurd answer like trying to save something some proposal it looked like a very desperate idea to suddenly uh, triple the number of degrees of freedom and the idea was that if this A takes values 1, 2, 3, and it corresponds to a SU2, uh, SU3 vector, then uh, one of these can be U1, the other could be U2, and the third could be U3, and we would save the exclusion principle, because now they are not identical, so they are not subject to exclusion. Okay. 
And today what we know is that SU3 Yang Mills theory is the gives the SU the vectors of this, the vector particles, these A mu's, uh, eight of them are the particles that are exchanged between these quarks and they are responsible for the strong interaction. I haven't introduced the quarks yet, but in the notes you will see how to couple the Angmills theory to fermions in the fundamental representation and that's all you need to do to get the theory of quarks and gluons which is called QCD. And one very puzzling question though was that these gluons if they exist uh, the Yang Mills particles, what is their mass? We haven't talked about the mass yet, but you know that photons are massless, and you know that this Lagrangian minus one fourth <coughs> F mu nu A F mu nu A certainly has no mass term. What would a mass term look like? Yeah, so it should have this. Well, it, it could have this, but that would break gauge invariance. This very complicated gauge invariance, which is slogged so hard to implement, would just be broken by having this term. But if we don't have this term, we have gauge invariance, but we have eight particles which are massless. Now, massless particles are not that hard to see in experiment, or because they propagate very fast and they are forever flying around. Hmm? Photons are just flying around all the time. It's hard to get rid of photons from a room. You have to really prevent them coming in. Other particles get absorbed, get uh, you know, deflected. Photons also get absorbed by dark material, but it's much harder. So there would have been experiments showing the existence of eight Yang Mills particles, and there were no such experiments. So there was a paradox. Is there a mass term in which case gauge invariance is gone, in which case why were we reading Yang and Mills's paper at all? Uh, or there's no mass term uh, in which case gauge invariance is there, but then what is the experimental status of this strange theory and all this will be resolved in the next over the next few days uh, in a series of discussions on how mass arises for vector particles which is one of the most exciting things in all of quantum field theory so i'll stop here <coughs> questions